Amen. How many love Jesus? Anybody here love Jesus? Amen. I love Jesus, and I love his church, and I love your pastor and his wife. Incredible leaders, incredible faithful. I think uh, in 1996, they became pastors, and uh, God has used them not only build a great church, but rebuild lives. And I am so thankful for being here and to call Pastor Joe my dear friend. You know, um, I'm always humbled when people introduce me because uh, they make this big deal that uh, I'm this superintendent guy. But in reality, um, um, my grandparents came from Mexico. My dad was a gardener. And today I'm the superintendent of the Assemblies of God. <laughs> what a great God we serve, right? And uh, matter of fact, I'm from a place called Pacoima, California. Anybody ever hear of Pacoima? Anybody? Anybody ever hear of Pacoima? Nobody? Okay. How many of you have ever been to Pacoima? Anybody? Oh, and you're still alive. Uh, that is a miracle because Pacoima is a rough place. How rough? I'm glad you asked me. Legend has it that one day these four guys were cruising in Pacoima, you know, and they were cruising and, and, uh, they took a turn a little bit too fast. Car overturned, and the four guys were killed. When they stood in front of the pearly gates, met by St. Peter, Peter said, what can I do for you, gentlemen? They said, we're from Pacoima. We like to come in. And Peter says, we don't have anyone from Pacoima up here in heaven. I'm going to have to talk to Jesus about this. So he goes, and he talks to Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, we don't have anyone from Pacoima up here in heaven. Go get those four guys and bring them in. So, you know, a few minutes later, Peter He's trying to catch his breath, Lord. They're gone. He said, the guys from Bacoma? No, the gates. <laughs> now, you have to be from Bacoma to tell that story. And I am from Bacoma. And there, my grandparents, who my grandpa, who came from Mexico, found Christ in a tent crusade. And that night, he was saved, delivered from alcohol, and called into the ministry and with the same night. Across the street from his house was a condemned dance hall. He buys it and turns it into a Pentecostal church. So at the age of five years old, I gave my life to Jesus in a condemned dance hall, and I've been dancing ever since for Jesus. So today, I don't have a testimony on how to overcome drugs, because I've never taken a drug. I can't tell you how to be delivered from alcohol. Well, that's not true. Every once in a while, I take a shot of NyQuil. We call that Pentecostal whiskey in our house. I can't tell you how to, about my criminal record. Or I don't, I can't, I don't, okay, what can you tell me? I can say this. The promises of God are real. And the saving power can keep you all the days of your life. That is my testimony. And that's why I'm so humbled to be here today. And, you know, uh, Pastor Joe and his wonderful wives, you know, I think about them all the time. You know, sometimes life doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. How many can agree with me? Didn't, all of a sudden, you were planning this or you had this and boom. And uh, I know in their life, things didn't happen what they ever thought would happen. And, you know, I remember as a small boy, um, getting caught on a chain link fence on my right arm, and the doctors told my mom he'll never be able to use his right arm again. You know, all of my life I've been told it will never happen. I remember, oh, he, he, the doctors told me, you learn to be left-handed because you'll never use your right arm again. I played baseball in college. I think I was a shortstop in college, and so... When people say it will never happen, God delights in saying, just watch me make it happen. But maybe you grew up all your life being told it will never happen. You'll never be happy. You'll never, you'll never find, you know, you'll never be sick. You'll never. I grew up in a Spanish-speaking church, and I don't even speak Spanish. They told me, God can't use you because God will only speak Spanish. He's not going to understand you. I mean, in fact, I remember... Our, I remember I applied to a Bible college, and, uh, and it was a Spanish Bible college that young people in my church went to. They rejected me. 
I was rejected from Bible college because on uh, that time you had to speak Spanish. Now nobody in that Bible college speaks Spanish. They all speak English. And I've been a board of director of that college. Um, but all of my life I've been told it will never happen. I'm the first Hispanic to ever hold this position in the Assemblies of God. They said it would never happen. And I'm sure you're here today. Someone told you it will never happen. You'll never be happy. You'll never be fulfilled. You'll never be lovable. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never be happy. Well, I know, and Pastor Joe and his wonderful wife, Teresa, uh, just I, I do have a scar on my arm. It doesn't hurt anymore. It just reminds me of the goodness and mercy of God. It's always a reminder. The scars that we carry are reminders that he bears scars for you and I. And, and I thank God for them. And I want you to know that it can happen. It can change. You can have a better life. But as I travel around the world, I often ask God, God, why? Today you belong to a fellow called the Assemblies of God. Almost 80 million people are attending an Assembly of God church around the world today. Every 55 seconds, someone is giving their life to Jesus Christ in the Assemblies of God church. God is moving. The Pentecostal movement is the fastest growing movement around the world. I've spent the last several years in Muslim countries. There are more Muslims who have come to Christ in the last 10 years than the last 100 years. I just was uh, last year in Egypt. In March, I'll be going to Sri Lanka. I've been to Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon. And man, it's against the law to evangelize someone. It's against the law to talk about Jesus. And yet those churches are packed with people. And of these 80 million, 70 million um, Assembly of God people, um, 7 million attend the United States. The United States of America is the seventh most lost country in the world today. How could that be? A country that God has blessed and missionaries around the world that we're seeing phenomenal, phenomenal conversions all over the world, and yet America's lost. And you go to these countries, and it's against the law. And yet, you come into their churches, and they're packed with people. They're packed. People walk miles. They know that if they're identified with the church, they could be persecuted, but let me tell you, they don't care because they found something that was real and life-changing and said, God can make a difference. And you say, we'd like to pray for you. We'd like to pray for you. And how many, how many need a miracle today? And they all stand up and they all get in line and they all want to be prayed for. And they literally grabbed my hand and they made me put it on their head to pray for them, and you see miracle after miracle after miracle. I'm like, God, how can we see miracles in other countries and we don't see them here in the United States of America? Don't you think God loves us? Don't you think God wants to do something with us, like you, me? Don't you think God hears us? What did it take? Why, why do some places you see this and other places you don't? For every thousand churches that are started in America, 4,000 churches will close. You don't believe your church will close one day, do you? Neither of those 4,000 other churches. Somehow, we've got away from believing God for miracles. That we, we got away from believing we serve a supernatural God that can deliver you from sin, that can deliver you from bondage, can, that can heal your marriage, that can save your children. Somehow, we got to get back there. But there are requirements, according to Scripture, for a miracle to happen in your life. How many today need a miracle in your life? Raise your hand. You need a miracle in your family, in your finances. You got children who aren't living for Jesus. You need a miracle. I mean, and people keep telling you it's never going to happen. But you believe somehow God can hear you, and he wants to do a miracle in your life, and he wants to do it today. And the great example is found in Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 35. It's about a blind man. As far as we know, he'd been blind all his life. He probably was born blind. The other gospel writer calls him Bartimaeus, but he was born blind. But I'm sure all his life, 
he thought, well, maybe one day I'll see. Maybe one day I can see the face of my wife and my kids. Maybe one day I'll be able to see a sunrise or sunset. Maybe one day. And I'm sure he was surrounded with people, just like you and I, who tell him, it will never happen. You'll never see until this day that we pick up the story in verse 18. And it says, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Let me stop there. We were all beggars at one time. We were spiritual beggars until one day Jesus walked by and came into our life. He was a beggar. He, he lived on the, the donations of people. He couldn't provide for himself. He was blind. Hopefully somebody would feel sorry for him. He was begging. But notice that when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I'm sure he thought, I've heard of this man. I've heard the things he's done. And maybe he can do something for me today. But you see something in this blind man's life that caused a miracle in his life that the same thing can happen to you and I today. And the first is, you've got to pray with passion. Did you hear it in his voice? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Did you come into the house of God with passion? Did you come with that kind of sense of urgency? Those of us who had ch have children, we know when they're really crying at night and when they're really crying at night, right? Because a parent listens to the tone of the voice of his child. God listens to the tone of your voice. Did you come with passion? Did you come with that intensity? Or did you come with take it or leave it attitude? And how many times do we get by the side of our bed only to fall asleep and get a, say, Lord, in the morning I'll pick this up? Because we lack passion. Passion. I'm a believer in passion because I believe it moves the heart of God. He's waiting for a passionate people in other countries with the greater the persecution, the greater of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The greater the persecution, the greater the, the presence of God and miracles. Why? Because these people say, I only got one chance, one hope. One answer, and it's Jesus, and I'm coming to him like this blind guy. This was his one shot. Jesus wasn't going to walk by this again. He said, this was my one shot. What is this? this is your one shot? Did you come with passion? The problem is we have what is called the God is good, God is grace prayer. How many of you ever started eating your food and wondered if you prayed or not? Come on, raise that chubby little hand with me. Come on. <laughs> we all have. Oh, man, I forgot to pray. Oh, Lord, you know, come on. Make the prayer quick. The food's getting cold, huh? But when you don't know when your next meal's going to come or when the doctor gives you some bad news that he can't help you, all of a sudden your intensity comes up. Why does it take a crisis for us to come to the Lord with passion? Why does it take some tragedy God is wanting us to come to the throne every time and say, Lord, I need help. Maybe that's the best prayer you can pray today. God, help. In Jeremiah 29, 13, you will find me when you seek me with all of your hearts. It is better to pray without words in your heart than, than it's better to pray with hearts than words. He's looking for your heart. He's looking for that passion. He's looking, come on, people. Call on me, he says, and I will answer you if you'll do it with all your heart. But not only does he pray with passion. In our story, notice, he prays with persistence. In verse 39, it says, those that led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Let's stop right there. The people that were leading Jesus, think about it. Tell this blind guy, hey, Jesus didn't have time for you. Jesus is a busy man. He didn't have time for you blind beggar on the side of the road. There will always be people. There will always be people that will discourage you. 
that would say you can't do it. Have you ever met someone who said, you know, you, know uh, you begin to tell them what your problem is, and they'll say this, well, I know someone who died of that. <laughs> there will always be those people that, that will keep you away. There will always be people. It can't happen. It could be a friend. It could be a spouse. It could be whatever. There will always be people. There were people actually trying to keep this guy quiet, but notice what it says. But he shouted out the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He was stubborn. He was persistent. God waits to see how much you want it. Is it because we have to wake up God, that he maybe is asleep, that we have to be persistent? No, he wants to see what you really want. I have seven grandkids, and they already told me, and we're, what, we're in January. They said, you know, Papa, on Amazon, I have my next year's Christmas list already. And they remind me every time they see me that they're what they really want God wants to know what you really want. Is he really wants to see if you really can. If you, if the problem is we quit too soon. We pray one time for our marriage. We pay one time for our children. We pay one time because of our sickness, and we give up. This blind beggar was persistent. See, God is preparing you in the meantime. He was preparing the children of Israel the 40 years. They weren't ready to go in. He's preparing you, but he really wants to see are you going to be persistent? God shuts his storehouse when you shut your mouth. Are you really persistent? Is it really important that your children know Jesus, that you're delivered from an addiction? Is it really something that is urgent in your life? It would be great. We could pray one time and it would go away, but many times we just have to be persistent and stubborn like this blind guy. He wasn't going to give up, and he wouldn't allow people to tell him to give up. The Bible says in Colossians 4, 2, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Other word places on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. Don't give up. It's always too soon to quit. This, the blind guy said, I ain't going to shut up. And he had kept being persistent. But not only is his prayer filled with passion. Oh, God, bring passion back. I loved your worship. It was it was passionate worship. Did you feel it? Did you participate in it? Or did you just kind of take it for granted? It's a persistence. So some of you, uh, it's taken a long time for you to get to the place you're in, but you didn't give up. I think of Pastor Joe and Teresa and what they've had to go through these years, but they didn't quit. They remained persistent. They didn't lose faith. Persistence. But notice, he prayed with a single purpose. The reason we don't see miracles and the reason our prayer is an answer because they're vague prayers. Vague prayers give vague answers. I've been in the ministry 45 years, and I prayed for hundreds of people, hundreds of people. And someone will come up to me and say, Pastor Rich, I need prayer. So what can I pray for you? And they said, I have an unspoken prayer request. And I said, well, I have an unspoken prayer. God bless you. Go. <laughs> vague prayers give vague answers. Vague prayers are lazy prayers. God wants a single purpose. Notice verse 40. And Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, notice this, what do you want me to do for you? Don't you think Jesus knew what this blind guy wanted? <laughs> Don't you think Jesus knew who this blind guy was? Don't you think since before this, this blind guy was born, Jesus knew this man had a need? But notice, he wanted him to ask. He said, Lord, I want to see, he replied. His, he was this one thing I want to see. What's the one thing you want? What's the one thing that's pressing him? He wants you to be specific in your prayers. What is your purpose? What do you really need, God? You know, God, I want you to bless me and my family. So, you know, sometimes problems can be a blessing. How many want more problems in your life? A single purpose. What's the one thing? I've had people, I could hear them at the altar, God, I'm not going to leave this altar until you save my husband or you save my child. I'm going to... 
Man, you can see how, man, they got one thing. This man had one thing. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus said, and the man said, I want to see. What do you need God to do for you today? It might not be addiction. It might be bitterness or unforgiveness that has crippled you and your relationships because of what someone has done to you. And you can allow it to continue to destroy you and your relationships, or you can say, God, I want to be delivered. This is the one thing, God, I want you to do for me today. Notice in James 4, 2 says, you desire but you do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. 20 times in the New Testament, you see the word ask. Ask and it shall be given. Ask and ask you do not have because you do not ask God. What do you need today? A miracle in your finances, a miracle in your body, a miracle for direction, for your relationship. What is the one thing that you ask him today? Man, I would not leave this building. Jesus is walking by. And like the blind guy, he prayed with passion. He prayed with persistence. And he said, Lord, this is one thing I need for you to do today in my life. But it's not over. Not only did he pray with passion and persistence and with a single purpose, he prayed with a positive attitude. Notice verse 42. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. He had a positive attitude. This blind guy actually believed Jesus could heal him. Do you? Do you actually believe? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Lord, you know, you know, doctors have said, you know, my, 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 I was born this way, and there's probably nothing. And we, we, our attitude, it's our attitude. As a Joy Beach can a different Assembly of God church every Sunday. Not this church, not this church, but most churches, some churches, I'm convinced, not this church, but in some churches, I'm convinced, instead of the water in the baptistry, they've put pickle juice because of the sour looks I see on people's faces. Shouldn't we be the happiest people on the face of the earth? Shouldn't we have more joy than the drunk that's stumbling out of the bar at two in the morning? It doesn't look like it because of our attitude. You know what's killing the church in America? It's not the enemy from the outside. It's the disunity from the inside. I spend most of my time, I thought God called me to preach the gospel and reach lost people. I spend most of my time refereeing churches because of how they've lost their positive attitude. Do you actually believe? Can you actually say, the joy of the Lord is my strength? He said, receive your sight because you have the right attitude. It's all about attitude. You can say it can never happen, or you can say it can happen. It's up to you because of your faith. But you say, Pastor Rich, I don't have much faith. I don't have much faith. I, 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 you know, one time a man came up to Jesus and said, Lord, can you, can you, can you heal my son? And, and Jesus says, you know, could you believe? I said, Lord, help me. Lord, help my unbelief. And he said, your son is healed. Why? Because a little faith and a great God brings great answers. It's not the size of your faith. It's the size of your God. A little faith and a great God brings great answers. Do you have the right attitude? To say today, man, today's going to be the day. Today I'm going to be set free. Today I'm going to have joy. Today that depression is going to be lifted. Today it's looking about your attitude. Notice in Mark eleven twenty four, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it and it will be yours. In other words, you've got to ask and you've got to believe. How can you have a more positive faith the Bible says faith come by hearing the word of God. You know there's 7,000 promises in this book. You should underline them, star them, highlight them, and pray them every day with a positive attitude. Philippians 4.19, and my God will meet only some of your needs. doesn't say that. Read it with me. For my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. you got to have a positive attitude. Maybe that's what you need to bring this altar today. 
God, help my attitude. Don't look at that person, but you know who I'm talking about. They're always complaining. They're always seeing the, the worst in situation. How can God do a miracle in your life, in your family, in your marriage relationships if you don't get that attitude resurrected again? He prayed with passion. He prayed with persistence. He wouldn't quit. He prayed with a single purpose, Lord, I want to see. He prayed with a positive attitude, Lord, I believe you can heal me. Finally, he prayed with a spirit of praise, Luke 18, 43. So immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Notice it says that when he received his sight, he followed Jesus and he praised God. I've seen God do miracle after miracle in people's lives, and that was the last time I saw him in church. <laughs> I said, thank you, God, for bailing me out of this. I'll see you someday when I need your help again. This guy was real. It said not only did he praise God, but he followed Jesus. What about you? I was declined to go to Bible college because I didn't speak Spanish. I found another college to attend. It was called Southern California College of the Summers of God and now called Vanguard University, and they accepted me. I didn't know a single person. I felt unqualified. I didn't feel smart enough. Uh, I didn't, my dad was a gardener who, you know, my, my roommate, his father, uh, pastored the seventh largest church in America. I'm thinking, who are you going to hire? A son of a gardener or the son of the seventh great biggest church in America? Uh, but while I was on that campus, I had a vision. And it was a vision of an angel. I, I knew it was an angel because she had blonde hair and blue eyes. And in my church, there were no blonde hair and blue eyes, you know. So I knew it was an angel. I said, I'm going to marry that angel. But I told the angel, if you wait till we graduate, because your parents are paying for your education, I can't pay for you, so let's, let's take advantage of your parents. <laughs> we're going to get married, and we're going to have a ministry, and we're going to see God do great things. And she actually believed me. <laughs> so last July would be 45 years I've been married to that angel. And we started out, man. We, a church who had never had a youth pastor before asked me to come. And matter of fact, I had, I, had, I had interned there on Sundays. And they said, we've never had a youth pastor before. And young people are coming. Will you be our youth pastor? I said, yes. And they said, well, we can pay you $50 a week. And I said, well, you know, I promised my, uh, my girlfriend for three years that I would marry her after college. And I don't know if I can make it on $300 a week. But um, why don't you let me work for my dad? He was a gardener. I'll work with my dad three days a week, and I can work for the church four days a week. And they said, well, step out of the room. So I stepped out of the room, and, and then they said, uh, um, yeah, we, we thought about it, and, and we don't want you to work. We're going to pay you $100 a week. I think, thank you, Jesus, man, $100 a week. And so I got on a the phone. There was no cell phones in those days. And I called my, my wife, Connie, and I, or my girlfriend, Connie, and I said, we can get married. They're going to pay us $100 a week. And then I went and looked for apartments, and the cheapest one I could find was $440 a month. But praise God, Connie was a business major, and she got a job as an assistant accountant, and she was making $300 a week. Praise God. And so we were in the ministry. God was doing great things. And, and I remember just seeing so many wonderful things happen. And God, when young people were getting saved, and, you know, somebody would give me some volleyball poles, you know, and I thought, man, maybe I could attract young people in the neighborhood to come. And so we painted, me and my buddy painted volleyball lines, and we sunk those poles, and kids would come every Wednesday. We had more young people in the community than had adults in the sanctuary. But, man, we were reaching young people. It was, it was wonderful. My dream was coming true. All those people said it never happened. I could say, look at what's happening. On Sunday morning, uh, before service, I'm meeting the pastor's office, and my, my ministry on Sundays was the ministry of announcements. 
And boy, I used to preach those announcements. I could just preach those announcements. So we would meet before service, and he'd say, okay, these are the announcements you need to make. But this Sunday was different. He said, Rich, I, I need something to tell you. And I said, Dad, I've decided to make a change, and this will be your last Sunday as our youth pastor. So we're going to walk from my office onto the platform. You're going to thank the people and tell them this is your last Sunday. And Connie, my wife, was hearing it for the first time on the front row, seven months pregnant with our first child, who's now 42 years old. They were right. It will never happen. I remember being so devastated. I said, God, what did I do to deserve this? I've tried to be faithful. You know, I, I've served you since I was five years old. And man, you, you begin to think maybe... Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe God doesn't, maybe God hasn't called me. Man, my dad felt sorry for me, and he was a gardener, and he would landscape homes. And it would just be nothing but dirt to these homes he would landscape. And the first thing he would do, because I didn't have any insurance, and he wanted to help me, so he hired me. But he'd hire a, a, a skip load to dump, a skip load of steer manure in the driveway. And there would be a wheelbarrow and shovel. And my job was to spread that steer manure throughout the yard. And the only thing worse than steer manure is hot manure. Because it would burn my eyes. And I'd find myself crying all day long. Not because of the manure. Because maybe they were right. It would never happen. Uh, remember... When you go through these kinds of times, and you will go through them, it teaches you three things. Number one, God is in control, not in you. God is in control. And sometimes it's not what you like, but do you believe he's in control? Second, God speaks to you in times of crisis. He always speaks to us, but do you listen to him? But when you're in crisis... C.S. Lewis says that God whispers to us in our pleasure, but shouts to us in our pain. The third thing it does, it makes you more sensitive to other people who feel like a failure. You're not so quick to judge when you're in that shoveling manure, man. You're, it makes you tender again to people. And I've been praying, God, if you give me a chance, God, if you give me a chance, I promise I will love you more. I'll love people more. I'll love your word more. I used to go interview with pastors, and I'd say, listen, I'm here you're for a pastor, and I'll come for free. And they would say to me, you're not the kind of youth pastor we're looking for. What do you do when they say it will never happen? I remember coming home every day after work on the back porch. Connie would make me come to the back porch, and she would make me take off all my clothes except my boxers. Don't picture it. It's not a pretty sight. Because I reeked of steer manure. It's December. My son was born December 12th. I have enough money to buy a Christmas tree. And I walk in, she's holding my newborn son in her arms, sitting on the couch with worship music playing and tears running down her eyes. I think, what are you praising God for? What are you so happy about? I, I shovel manure, woman, for a living. And she said these words. You forgot your promise, haven't you? Don't you hate it when your wife tells you something that you don't want to hear? because I knew exactly what she meant. Now, I don't know if you were raised in a Mexican home or someday you'd like to be raised in a Mexican home. <laughs> I was raised in a Mexican home. And every Friday night, we'd have dinner with my grandpa and grandma. My grandpa was my hero. <laughs> All my life, I wanted to be like my grandpa. I wanted to be able to know God the way he did, love people the way he did. But we couldn't come. So every Friday night, and I remember I was about, about 8, 10 years old, and uh, we, we couldn't go through the front door because there was always a line of people on the porch waiting to be prayed for by my grandpa in the living room. 
So we'd always have to come through the back door, and the back door was the kitchen, and the kitchen was my grandma. She was always in the kitchen. I think she lived in the kitchen, and she was always cooking. Oh, I can smell those tortillas and beans even right now. I'm getting hungry. And I said, Grandma, you need to understand, my, my grandpa learned English so he could speak to his grandson who couldn't speak Spanish. But she loved me. And he said, I said, Grandma, where's Grandpa? She said, me, he's in the shed. I said, is he fixing bikes? He would find broken down bikes and give them to kids in the community who couldn't afford a bike. He was a wonderful man. She said, no, mijo, he ain't fixing bikes. He's praying. I said, Grandma, how long has Grandpa been praying? She said, mijo, he's been praying for three days, locked in a shed, praying to God. And as a young boy of 10 years old, I remember pressing my ear to the door of that shed. And then you understand, my grandpa, well, we'd take him to, to restaurants. He'd make everybody in the restaurant bow their head and pray. Yeah. Man, he had this booming voice. You, know, you see, I don't speak Spanish, but I understand Spanish. So you say something behind my back, I know what you're saying. But his prayers always went something like this. Bendito Padre Santo de Cielo y Padre Padre Mío. And I knew the man and the others over that side of that shed had a direct line with God. And he's praying for his nine children by name. Two had died at birth. And then he prays for all their spouses. Then he begins to pray for every grandchild and great-grandchild by name. And as he's praying, he mentions my name. He says, dear great God in heaven, use my grandson to be a preacher of the gospel. <laughs> May you take him around the world to proclaim, oh, I wish you could go with me, Pastor Joe, to Sri Lanka in March. We've been invited to Thailand and North India. Oh, I've been all over the world because I knew what I was going to do the rest of my life because of that prayer. And she said, you forgot your promise. Maybe you forgot his promise. That by your stripes you are healed. That he could provide for all of your needs. He hasn't forgotten about your son, your daughter, your health, your finances. He's waiting for you. The word praise appears 550 times in the Bible. I began to, to sit down next to Connie on the couch, <laughs> and we just praised God. We just both started praising God. And I said, God, if I never go back to the ministry, if you never use me as a minister, I'm still going to love you, and I'm still going to serve you, and I'm still going to be faithful, oh God. Because of all what you've given me, this wife and this new son, Lord, I thank you and I praise you. The next day I came home from shoveling manure. Connie said, you got a phone call from this pastor. I'd never heard of him. A town I'd never heard of. So I called him and he said, are you Rich Gare? I said, yeah, I'm Rich Gare. He said, I heard about you. I said, oh, no, the manure story's out. <laughs> so we're looking for a youth pastor which you can consider come seeing me. I said, I'll come tonight. <laughs> I said, we're in revival services tonight. I didn't realize it was about 70 miles away, and I scrubbed off that manure, got in my little VW bug, and went as fast as that thing could go, and I walked in. The service already started. And I walked in the back, and God said to me, you're home. Come home today. Come home to his presence. Come home to his promise. Today, believe God that that miracle you've been praying for will happen. He's saying to all of us, come home. Will you pray with me, Heavenly Father? In the name of Jesus. There are people here that have been told it'll never happen. You'll never be happy. You'll never be successful. 
you'll never find love. You'll never be healed. Your child will always be lost. And one day Jesus is walking by. May they be like that behind beggar and say, oh, it's Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. God, I pray that they will be passionate, they will be persistent, they have a single purpose, and they will have a spirit of praise today, that today Jesus is walking by. You know, we all know who the hero of the story is, it's Jesus. But there's another hero in the story, the person who brought the blind man to that place. He couldn't get there by himself. Someone had to bring him, sat him there. There are blind people all around us. They are waiting for you to bring them to Jesus so they can call out in his name. But today I want to pray for you. If you're here today, you say, Pastor Rich, I need a miracle in my life. I need God to do something today. You can walk out the same condition you walked in. That blind man could have gone home blind again. But this was his one chance, and he was going to take advantage of it. That can be you today. If you need a miracle, would you just lift your hand up? Just, right, just lift it up. Where are you at? Come on. He knows before you ask. <laughs> he knows your condition. But he's waiting, just like the blind man. He said, what do you want me to do for you? He knew what he wanted, but he wanted the blind man to ask. Jesus, I want to see he says, your faith has healed you. That can be your testimony today by simply asking. Would you do me one more favor? It says that when this blind man received his sight, it said he'd be, he said, I'm going to praise God, I'm going to follow Jesus. <laughs> and it said everybody in that city who saw him, they also followed Jesus. They saw something so miraculous. He said, I want what he has. Just think about it. As a young boy, I was able to lead my own mom to Jesus. <laughs> she said, Son, you have something I don't have. I said, Mom, it's Jesus. People around you will want what you have, but it starts with you. So why don't you stand with me all over this building and Pastor Joe's going to come in just a moment and we're going to end this service. And... But I believe if you'll call out his name, he will answer you. Better yet, I'd love to pray with you. So if you need a miracle in your life, would you do something that I believe God will respond to your faith and then slip out of your seat and come and stand here with me. And maybe you're with someone and you'll come with them. A husband, a wife, a father, a mother, friend, you'll come with them. You'll say, I'm going to stand with you. You're not alone. You belong to a community of faith, man. You belong to a family of God. When one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Come on. These are your family members. You think you're the only one with problems? We all got problems. But we serve a miracle-working God. <laughs> and maybe your faith, along with theirs, can see their miracle answer. And so Pastor Joe is going to come. He's going to lead us in prayer. Remember, come with some passion today. Come with persistence. I don't care if you prayed a hundred times. It could be that hundredth and one time that answered. <laughs> that one more time. <laughs> but you quit. And that one next time could have been it. <laughs> Come with a single purpose. What's the one thing you need? Yeah, it's, it's like, it's, don't say, Lord, bless me. God, I need this today. He wants you to ask. And then do it with a spirit of praise. Come on, lift up your hand. Those of you around, to those that would like to come and join with these in prayer, you come and pray with them. And Pastor Joe's going to lead us, and we're just going to pray and believe God for your miracle today. And you're going to leave here praising God and following Jesus 
And everyone you know is going to see the miracle in your life in Jesus' name. Thank you, friend. Amen. Amen. Okay. So why don't we just take a second and let's just praise God. Just praise him. For Thank you, Jesus. Out loud. You are the God that can do all things. Jesus. You are the God that can strengthen us in every situation. You are the God that can clear up our thinking. You are the God that can calm our minds. You are the God that can change our direction. You are the God that can answer the impossible. You are the God who's in charge of all things at all times. We bless you this morning. We exalt you this day, God. We magnify your name. And we come to you as beggars. But we come to you not only as beggars, we come to you as children of yours. So we're going to do something different too. Put your arms around the person next to you because we're coming in unity. We're coming as a group of your children holding up each other. I want you to picture right now your, your prayer, that single prayer you need, that single thing. There's a lot of things, but there's got to be one thing. That's what we're lifting up today, that one thing, the one thing. And I want you to say to the Lord like that guy did, Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on me. Say it with passion. Jesus, son of David, mercy on me. Say it again. Now I want you to picture in your mind you looking at Jesus and he looking at you because you're significant to him. Look him in the eyes and then repeat again, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And as he said, receive what you need. Receive what you need. It is yours. Why? Your faith has healed you. Your trust in him. Whether I see it today, whether I see it tomorrow, I I walk by faith, not by sight. That blind man saw better than many of us do. Let's ask the Lord one more time. Jesus, son of, have mercy on me. Then I want you to close with this. I receive your answer. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I exalt you, God. You are high and lifted up. Jesus said, when I'm lifted up, all men will look at me. Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters right now that your pure blood will just flow over them. You would bless them with your touch and your presence. You will strengthen them for their journey ahead. I pray you give them great wisdom as they move from this place today into their lives. I pray they will notice in the next couple of days, whoa, something's different. And so we thank you in advance. Just like the blind man that could see his life was changed. And he had to journey forward in a new way. Father, I pray for each one of these people that they would journey forward in a new way. Give them greater sight than what they possess now. Give them greater wisdom and passion and purpose. Lift their heads. We bless you this day. We exalt you this day. We magnify your name. And all those who agree, amen. God bless you guys so much.
Thank you, Pastor Rich.